just to introduce some topics. What I wanted to talk about today was, I was originally calling it ethics, and I've actually worked out that um, it's a trouble we have with empathy with teams. Um, that's me, I'm Scott. Um, as I said, I work, um, you know, do a lot of work with the Heart of Agile. One of the things that we do with Heart of Agile is we kind of focus on four areas of reflection and questioning, and uh, we tend to do a systems thinking approach. We tend to do um, Socratic questioning as well. One of the biggest areas that I like to, uh, that I've been thinking about is reflection, and I've been reflecting on some things from the last project, and I really wanted to talk about those um, stories um, on this call. Uh, one of the things I like to do is build teams, um, and a lot of the teams that we build are almost like pirate teams. They're self-contained. They're out for themselves. They, yeah, really focused on on what they're doing. Um, I've been quite influenced by this book, Be More Pirate, which is uh, an excellent book, and, and I would recommend it. I think that great teams are made of great people, uh, but everywhere I go in agile transformations, it feels a lot more like this which is, uh, you know, people reaching across the table, arguing and everything else. Um, so I started reflecting on this. So what's causing this? Um, and, you know, really I started thinking about empathy um, and the fact that when we build these great teams, especially, you know, that are very focused on what the team's doing, um, how are they thinking about the rest of the organization? How are they thinking about the wider thing? Um, if you think, if you're part of the Agile community, how do you think about people not in the Agile community? If you're part of the um, safe community, how do you think about the rest of the Agile community? If you're a coder, how do you think about non-coders doing Agile? Um, and the more and more I thought about this, you know, em empathy was, uh, you know, had its fingerprints all over it. Perhaps we've got a bit of discussion about empathy, but um, and what it means to everyone. But in some sense, we use it for everything good about things. Um, and in other ways, we use it about understanding how other people think. Uh, but the context I'm really looking at is the one that Daniel Pink and others talk about is when we say it's that sense of putting ourselves in other shoes. Uh, and we are also very visual people. So if you've ever seen the war zone things, if you ever see like a, a child in a picture, there'll be a lot of empathy. You'll have identify a lot for that child in the picture. If there's a headline in numbers that say 10,000 people died, again, we don't, we don't really take it on board. So in that time... In, in Agile, I've seen uh, yeah, I've built great teams uh, yeah, that are working in new ways. Old arguments have been dropped. Success has been shared. People have been flourishing. People are more human. At the same time, especially within our community, uh, I see intolerance, prejudice on encoders, unethical behavior between people, arguments on uh, you know, psychological safety. There's one raging just now around about, uh, you know, is feminism part of Agile? Uh, you know, disputes on agile methods, disputes on certification, and, and just sometimes the, the behavior is just illogical. There's a couple of books I would probably draw your attention to. Uh, one's The Dark Side of Empathy, which I read and uh, really affected me. A lot of moral action is actually skewed because of empathy, and we don't probably don't think about that. So I'd really like to discuss that. Um, again, the great book, Against Empathy, and, and this one bloomed in a lot of analysis and studying. Um, and uh, you know a lot of the things that we do where we spend our money who gets to go to university who doesn't it's all to do with uh, who we've got empathy for um, and the news and the media and everyone else just feeds that um, so I've got three stories one story I want to talk about is uh, where we uh, had a prioritization game um, and uh, we had a lot of people there so we split them into two groups and in the first the first group um, uh, I was helping another coach out and uh, more people came to the session than we'd expected. So we were going to run the uh, the balloon game. So in the balloon game, you prioritize who would be allowed to stay on the balloon as it's heading to a mountain. So obviously hot air balloons and Swiss people, you know about this. Sometimes you need to throw people out to get over the mountain. Um, and uh, what we allowed people to do was, uh, was prioritize, you know, from a list of celebrities and people who would uh, you know, who would be first to go out the balloon? Who would be last to go out the balloon? Um, I'm not sure if you've played this one before, but it's quite a useful way to get people to think about the collaboration on prioritization. We split the teams into two groups just based on height, completely random. Um, and there was team one and team two. And uh, team one and team two uh, made up their own list. And then we presented the lists and they were slightly different and they came up with different acceptance criteria to try and show 
tribe prioritization over squad prioritization, we thought, let's play this again, but let's put everyone together uh, with the same celebrities and see what happened. Um, and a huge argument happened and a huge fight happened. In the debrief, we said, uh, you know, what, what was going on? Um, and almost the sides were coming to blows about the prioritization of this order of celebrities that had, had no meaning and it wasn't important. And at one point I said, look, guys, you only formed these two teams 10 minutes ago. <laughs> Why have you, have 10 minutes later, are you, are you, you know, struggling and uh, arguing about, you know, you know, whether or not, uh, you know, Donald Trump, you know, should be out of the balloon first or not. I'd, I'd like a little bit of help from the other coaches on the call, right, and, and people. So what, what do we think was going on there? The fact that you can get two random groups of people, pull them together into a very short exercise, and then when you pull them together to be uh, one team, they just can't agree, and they've just got so much disagreement. If these guys are German and French, indeed. Scottish. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know Scottish. But German is always against my principle. No, is that possible? But is it... Is it that weird? So uh, do you link this with the uh, uh, forming, norming, storming, performing approach, you know? Is it, uh, obviously these teams had a sense of team. Yeah, so team one and team two didn't, although it was very easy to make them just by tapping them on the shoulder, uh, it seemed almost impossible to break them to put them into, you know, team A, which were they were all part of. They couldn't leave the the ten minute legacy they had. Okay, so you 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 create teams just for the purpose of creating teams. Yeah, and random. There was nothing. It wasn't like group one and group two had worked together for years and years and years. It wasn't as if we were talking about a prioritized list of work that was very very important. Yeah, it was trivial. The exercise. What would you love to see emerging? I think the point of the exercise is that everyone can understand and uh, agree a criteria for prioritizing. Yeah. Okay. And we could do that at a tribe level as opposed to squad level. Uh, tribe and squad is just another dimension of teams, right, guys? Yeah. Yeah. But I think, th I, I think this reflects a lot on what happens when we go in and do agile transformations with organizations, that we, we come along to teams and we smash them together into new teams uh, and we're surprised when they hold their old thinking. Mm -hmm. Can I challenge you? I would love to having the Marcus opinion on this as a systemic coach. I'm sure you have completely different perspective. <laughs> Not at all. Oh, yeah? but, well, it's very simple, simple group dynamics from the 60s. It's called group identification. And mm -hmm. there are a lot of lots of ways how you can make a group identify. So building so the, 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 from, this, from this, this norming phase that you just mentioned, simply give them something to decide on, give them something that they can identify on. And the uh, uh, um, prioritization is, uh, is, um, is, I think, one a great way to make a group uh, like struggle a little bit together. But mm -hmm. uh, when they overcome it, uh, they identify themselves. And when, so they kind of have a good, uh, uh, so good, good group dynamics and a good uh, um, binding. So... Uh, of course, they they don't want to mix. They don't want to leave this just built up dynamics to mix with the next team and to <laughs> then go into the next group dynamic. So it's very very basic. Complete understanding that it's a great game. Thank you very much. <laughs> so how can we how can we learn from this when we're doing agile transformations? Uh, is is the purpose really to build a team? Um, build systems which is a little bit different and it's based on a common purpose. So I focus on the common purpose before and then I can see the constellations or let's say an emerging systems. And then you can say, okay, my system is not bigger than seven, eight people or a system starts with two or three guys and not one, one is not a system. These are the game rules of a game, which is a little bit different and you have to observe on what they're working. And then I make you think a little bit more complicated. I take into account flocking behavior, meaning you're in a team doing a certain period of time, then you can also uh, separate. Okay. The team is not forever. Yeah. But do we, are we kind of maybe at a human instinct level, we have a bias towards thinking teams are forever? Uh, and Mark, what is your opinion on that? Um, I agree it's good to, to build team. To team, team team spirit and then i also agree, agree with what you you mentioned before that uh, once a team is built 
it's difficult. I mean, you need to start from scratch. Even if you just bring in two or three new people to the team, it's a whole new dynamic that gets created and uh, you cannot get that by just saying, okay, you're going to work together as of tomorrow and in one week you're going to be, again, fully productive. Uh, I think it has to do with a relationship that you create as a system, as a team. And of course, yeah, merging two teams is an example of that. Yeah, so, so, so in, in the, for example, I'm in small in my scrum team, so there we reduced the team from 14 to 8, and now it's like the team is completely different. It's like a change process for them, even if it's only the team is shrinking, but it's like they, they're getting crazy. They say they request, they're asking, is this okay what we are doing or not? So it's, it's like in a, in a change process. Christoph, I have a question to you. Has the team decide to shrink or somebody outside from the team? Somebody else, so let's say we, we, um, there are some externals and we are not able to like, continue in the, in the, in the companies. Um, we, are, we don't have budgets, that's why they have to leave. And uh, some guys go to another uh, part of the company or take a sabbatical or something. So it was not the, the decision of the team. Okay, the mommy and daddy get divorced and it's a huge pain for the kids, right? Yes. And now they are questioning everything. Yeah. And here's, here's, here's Uncle Agile coach to look after you. <laughs> so here you have I, to think. I, I suppose uh, what works for me is uh, from the scratch, give teams really a strong meta perspective. So from the scratch, they can do their team stuff, of course. Everybody likes to identify, do group dynamics and stuff, and everybody likes to have a strong like binding together. But at the same time, what kind of brings you out is really a strong reflection reflective perspective which goes way beyond the normal retrospective stuff so really yeah. kind of from the scratch tell them to to think like from the outside on the team and on the other teams and that this team is just a big just a part of a big picture and uh, the big picture is maybe more important than the team or as important as, as the team. So it's really about metacognition is called in psychology Sabine, any, do you have an opinion on this? So for me, personally, it's more important to create systems than especially like teams. Because yeah, teams can change very fast, but you have to recognize the system and also to improve the system. For me, um, teams are just a part of the system. But anyway, um, it, it needs to have a strong um, relationship between. And this is for me a key of success. Thank you. I think uh, what we're touching here, because I, I, I heard a lot of emotions about the team, like uh, uh, a center of emotions working together. I think what we're talking about are maybe the wrong, uh, the wrong coaching aspect. Uh, personally, I use something else. I, I use the satire model, which is family coaching. Yeah. And so, because this is the same emotions having in the family of if, if, if the parents are doing wrong is really, so I have this satire model uh, book with me. So I say, okay, how, how do I do with in this functional family, right? Yeah, and how, what is the name of this kind of model? Satire. Satire. V Virginia Satire. Hold on, I will uh, show you the book. Uh, so one question to Marcus. So you think it's, uh, it's good if I get with the team outside of the, work from the perspective outside of the team to reconstruct it again? Did I get it right? Can you repeat your question? So you said something that I should go with the team outside, from the perspective outside of the team to re reconstruct it again. Is this correct? Yeah. Okay. So they, it's good that they question everything. In a way, yes, because uh, this is called uh, just like uh, emancipation. Mm -hmm. uh, this questioning everything. Um, yeah, uh, shouldn't be about the system. I think the system uh, should be like uh, uh, be able to give the context um, where the team is embedded. But um, yeah, I agree that when you're changing, when you're changing the the teams all the time, it's it's not like a teams are not like just a machine or something. Mm -hmm. They are made of people and. You, uh, and this is also not good when somebody else decides this. Maybe there are some other models that the team itself can choose maybe and, and be, be dynamic about its composition. Uh, but because we're talking about people, uh, we cannot 
predict everything like all these emotional stuffs and and so on so they have to get to learn themselves and but what they um i mean when 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 you guys say i think christoph and and michael i said like they're questioning everything maybe they shouldn't question the uh, the way of work or um the the the, the, the bigger system so maybe we can prevent that uh, when we have have a uh, this, this this good systems uh, implemented, so it gives gives the context of of the of the team. So maybe we can prevent the questioning everything, but in in this sense. But of course, questioning the um, how to work together and getting to learn uh, themselves in the team. I think this is so natural, and I think there is also this thumb. Um, uh, something called um, the rule of thumb that every, I don't know how you guys feel this but it says that um, every time when you change somebody in the team it reflects on the productivity of everyone else in the team at 25% for the next uh, six months uh, I don't know if you know this rule of thumb I think it's in this uh, scrum patterns community it is written there but I think this is the, this is a big impact when you change all the times the, the team players the, the the people in the teams, of course, they have to get to know themselves and empathize and, and everything. So it takes time. They are, the team is not like a machine or something. It's mm -hmm. um, composed of people. But when Pierre is talking about the system, uh, when it is clear. Um, what is the purpose of the team and what is the, the context of the team and this is already clear for everybody but at least we could prevent to question these type of things so maybe we can accelerate one side you have a system and the second side you have a dynamic in the system so the system is quite like uh, a factory is not has no emotion at all mm -hmm. and and then you have the dynamics which are the system which is based on emotions and people and, and, and the example from uh, Christoph was somebody outside of a system influencing a system which is called a team. And I saw the smile in, uh, on Marco's face when he mentioned this. Am I correct here? Okay, so we've, we've decided that an area of a bank is going to go um, and work in an agile way. We decided to make four squads up, use this Spotify model. I don't know if anyone knows about this, but... A squad is like a team, so it's four teams aligned in a tribe model. It's just this, this idea of four teams working together in a, in a kind of business unit or a domain or whatever, we'll, whatever you want to call it. Um, when we formed, we used, um, we, we realized that each of the teams were going to be working in Scrum. What we didn't have was a kind of a mechanism for uh, getting everyone together. And we wanted to be very open and explain vision and explain what we were looking for. So we developed this activity. We called it the campfire, but it was really an open space activity. So everyone in a big room, in a circle, together as one tribe. Anyone could ask any question. Uh, you know, the kind of any ideas were always put there. If anyone was having difficulty, it could be discussed. Um, and one thing we found was all the feedback on the campfire was negative. So people hated being in their open space. And so much so that we were supposed to have scheduled, I think over six months, we were supposed to have scheduled seven and we only had two. Each of the squads working in their team were, and each of the retros, at every retro said, they'd like to know what the other teams were doing. <laughs> Right, so here's my problem <laughs> or question. Why would the people in the tribe not identify so much with the tribe that they'd like to spend time together, but at the same time say that their biggest problem is they don't know what everyone else is doing? I'd, like, I'd, I'd just like to throw that one open because that, really, that was a really interesting puzzle for me. Is there the need to... I mean, why is there the, the, the need to kind of make that um, meetings in a structured way? Saying okay, yeah, we're going to meet that day, that time. What would have, what would be the def difference if these people would access that information more informally? Um, 
I think the tribe identification level would have been uh, diminished. So people's primary identification would have been at uh, team level. One of the other things that was occurring was that there were, each of the teams didn't walk around anyone else's visualizations. So team A didn't go to team B, team A didn't go and stand in team B stand up. Um, and there was a lot of deep suspicion uh, on, on each of the other teams. And it was hoped that the, the tribal level activity would actually get these people that who had worked together it was an existing department. They'd worked together um, sometimes against each other for many years. So the tribal level was, was seen as a, a place where they could all come together and identify on the, on the broader vision. Um, whereas at, at the individual team level, uh, you know, they felt comfortable, but they didn't feel comfortable enough to walk around the collegiated space and, and interact with other teams. These guys wouldn't go, these, the different squads wouldn't go to the pub together either. That's... <laughs> I have a stupid question, a bloody question bubbling in my mind again, Scott, is um, uh, how do you, did you facilitate that meeting? We, we deliberately selected a group of people to run those meetings uh, that, weren't, that weren't scrum masters and they weren't product owners and they weren't managers. Um, and it was designed to be the larger team's meeting uh, where they could set the agenda. So it was really an open meeting where they could they could really do what they want. If they wanted to, if they wanted to hold management to account, they could. If they wanted to complain for twenty minutes, they could. Uh, if they wanted to have an award ceremony, they could. And uh, and and latterly, we did all those things. You know, we celebrated success. We did all those things, but it was really handed over to the 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 people in the teams at team level. And a second question, because it's already have uh, The second question: How did you ask the question? Ask which question? The, uh, how did you ask the question to the team? Was it an open question, or you let the conversation going? So the feed. It was actually monitoring the feedback. So we did um, we did anonymous feedback on it. We asked everyone: Did they like the ceremony? You know, was it useful? Uh, what did they like? What didn't they like? You know those those kind of questions. Yeah, and is if the feedback session where we got the everyone saying uh, you know they, they didn't like it. Um, at one at one one on one session, someone said um, you put us together in new teams uh, that we're trying to work with people that we have maybe hated for years, and then you put us in a a room with other people that we've even that that we also hate, and there was too much to focus on all at once. <laughs> Uh, I'll give you just a thinky because uh, I was thinking usually uh, the facilitation process is usually key. Uh, mm. How you ask the question is like these clean question things. You have to be non-directive so people are not feeling uh, trapped. And 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 one of the tricks of play fourteen, whether it's working well, is we are starting with socializing. Mm. Socializing is not on the end. So we have so you have uh, four hours icebreakers. Uh, you're drinking beer together. So we, then the next time, then you say, okay, tomorrow we will talk about that and you're free to speech. Meaning the hate <laughs> is removed or maybe you have, okay, so you break the ice. And usually uh, when, you, when you have a word session, when I have word session, you say, oh, damn, I, I, I didn't make a good icebreaker because yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. bosses and... And, and but we did do some of the we did those those social things. We did have some briefing sessions before, um, just so people kind of could get accustomed that change was coming. Um, but yeah, they, they kept cancelling those campfire meetings. Yeah, another thing is always always ask for uh, feedback during the session. Yeah. Never, never with the poll because with the poll, then you say, okay, it was great, but not so great, you know. And I don't give a, a ten; I just give maybe a five because ten is yeah. too. It's not humble, is it? I have a stupid um, proposition. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not like from the from the scratch in the agile community, but rather from the systemic community. I always thought that uh, self-organized teams that agile is about self-organization in teams, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, one of the the core like principles is deliberate. So how 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 much free will do the team members have in 
constellation constellation in, of their teams, but it seems that they are just uh, thrown into this uh, context. And of course, this is from the beginning like a, it's a conflict yeah. programmed, which you can facilitate, of course, but the facilitation for me would be the second best alternative. Yeah. And, and that's a good point. Uh, real well spotted there. Um, at six months into it, we let the team self-select and they came up with a completely different structure. <laughs> what are the boundaries of that self-selection? So uh, we, we can just pick someone in the department? Yeah, or? the way the teams were set up were kind of functional. Um, and what we did was we looked at the customer journey and uh, we split it up along the stages of the customer journey. Um, and that seemed to be much more natural. We let everyone look at where they thought their role was um, and put a post-it sticker on each of the teams. Um, and uh, if they thought they would be in two teams, we gave them two post-it stickers. So we used a little... Um, and um, what we found was that the people just used one post-it sticker. And the teams were fairly balanced anyway. We also looked at where the work had been from the various um, uh, visualization boards. And we found that people were actually selecting to go where the work was as well. So we'd, actually self-selection was like the best thing we ever did. Yeah, but for Marcus, it's a learning process. Yeah. As we discover, it's not about self-organized teams for self-organized systems. What we call complex system is our self-organized. And then we discover that we have to teach and help people as a coach. You mostly you have to coach them to be self-organized. Yeah. And, I, and, yeah. I think I think the I think the um, the nicest thing of that situation for me personally was uh, um, I spent most of my time sitting in the uh, in the kind of the comfy area as I called it. You know, where all the sofas and everything. And people would come and ask questions, and uh, I would ask them what they thought, and then they'd go away. And they they did all of this stuff. They asked for self selection themselves. They they researched the stuff. They did it all themselves. Really nice. But the only thing I had to do was fight with management to let them do it. Uh, sorry, just one question. Did self selection uh, process was after this uh, session? Six months. That you, six, six months, months after that. I would I'd, I'd kind of argue that everyone had been working in such a fragmented way before then. It wasn't until we kind of formed the Agile way of working that anyone understood what the system was. People had just been doing work. And uh, by the end of that six months of the reorganizing and everyone, it was actually about four months in, they were at, starting to ask about restructuring. Uh, but at that point, they, you, know, you could see that they understood the system and they, had, and they felt ownership for it. But at the beginning, it was very much, you know, we're people that work at a bank and we get told what to do by the project managers. And this is a fascinating process. So uh, the things I uh, experiment is we give a three months, we, we all, uh, all the stakeholders are building a three months uh, plan, high level plan. What do we try to achieve? You know, the doers, operations and management and decision makers and customers if possible. And then we have a roadmap. Do we have dependency? Yes, no. And everybody has a word, right? And you, know, as a coach, you take care that everybody speaks out. And, and then you ask, and the, uh, the kind of official, and who wants to work where? And, and sometimes you have a thing uh, in huge complex on the roadmap like finance. And then you have these famous dependencies. And you have a, a team member. I would love to work in team B, but a member of team A, which are my mates. And, and they say, then it's okay. Then you're on both teams, but you have to take care. You will have double meetings. So, are you sure that this is what you want? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Then it's okay. But it means you have the option. You have the option to, to move from another team to another. Meaning separation is not an obligation. It's an option that you can take or not. And, and at a team level, uh, I, I will uh, write a post about it. I use apple trees. You have apples, which are the outcomes, uh, the roots and the fruits, and the roots are the, what you need to do, to do. And the rest is business as usual is all the waste, which is managed. And the teams every month select what, what they are working on. Then you say, oh, guys, this is really too much. How do you want to organize yourself? And based on this easy way of doing things, they decide themselves, maybe we should separate the team during one sprint. Because it's too much. It's we have too much focuses. 
because they never work on a single solution. They always have a, a portfolio of products. But these teams you decide, and those as the coaches say, okay, guy, but we are keeping the same rhythm to avoid over alignment. Then is and Catherine, do you have any opinion on this? Welcome. Hi, Tim. So uh, Scott has a topic about uh, how uh, to behave as a team when you have some kind of struggle, and then you have to separate the teams. Do you have a good ideas about to keep them together? to create empathy so people are, 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 are willing to work together. Okay, I, I will think a little bit and, and come back to you when the ideas uh, pop up. Yeah, good. Scott, this was a very oriented question for anne Catherine. Okay, thank you. <laughs> that was very well facilitated. <laughs> another story. Can I do another one? No, as, much, as much you want. Okay, so the tribe is now formed, okay, and uh, Part of what we've got in the tribe is we need some support, uh, te technical support. And the technical support comes from a small team. And this small team has to do lots and lots of different teams in the bank. Um, so they're a kind of component team, we could call them. Um, in the banking setting, they were called a center of excellence. Okay, The center of excellence has some skills that the, team need to, that the teams need to dip into. So we're familiar with that kind of scenario. Not a core feature team member. Not a, not, a, not a resource you'd probably need all the time, but uh, um, you know, it could be legal, it could be some technical operational stuff for that. Um, thumbs up if you kind of get that kind of idea of what I'm talking about. Is that the topic about experts? Uh, a little bit, but I think it's, let me, let me talk a little bit about what happened. So when the tribe was formed, uh, the center of excellence people uh, from this team um, said they didn't want to be part of the tribe. They couldn't be part of the tribe. They couldn't be embedded in the squads. Uh, but what they would do is they would come along and come to stand ups, and they would get involved in the in the prioritisation uh, and and other discussions. Um, and very quickly, they then took all their staff up to another floor. So imagine two floors in a building. So one, they're in the co-located space, and then they've now in their own department area. And then they're not doing any work on any of the teamwork. The teamwork starts slowing down. The tribe starts raising it as an issue that we're not getting any support from the center of excellence. The center of excellence, uh, you know, then says their backlog of work is bigger than the backlog of work from the tribe. Um, and then as an escalation goes to the you know, central planning people. And uh, I think it went to board level actually. And then uh, uh, the, the center of excellence people were ordered to go and join the tribe so they had to walk downstairs go to the squads they then demanded their own kanban board <laughs> uh, so they could prioritize their own work so we've now got uh, we've now got four squads that, are, that need this expert help but they've now got to go to the queue on another board to get access to that discussion and the people from the center of excellence they wouldn't um, they wouldn't come to any meetings they wouldn't agree with anything a complete paranoia broke out. Anytime either of the sides said anything, the other side assumed that they were trying to uh, stiff them or something. I'll give an example. One resource um, uh, one person, wasn't a resource, correct myself. One person actually went home in tears because she'd been, uh, she'd been asked to do three things by, uh, you know, by the tribe, by the center of excellence, by the tribe, by the center of excellence in the one day um when the when the the bank management said that we really need this one activity to happen uh then the center of excellence went to board with we can't do these eight things because we're doing this one piece of tribe work it got to the stage where people would walk out yeah you know, if they saw each other in the corridor they'd walk away from each other what's going on there why is the tribe so threatening to people that aren't in the tribe Looks to me like a butterfly effect right you make a small nudge, small change somewhere, and then yeah, a box effect also like. I, th I think that I think there might have been a you know like a small argument gets a bit bigger, and then people go to their corners. But there's no there's no descaling mechanism to get them back down. And what was the initial purpose of uh, sending that people to the other floor just because there was no oh, no, they, no they, they, they 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 took their football home. They uh, 
they left. <laughs> they didn't want to be part of the tribe. Okay. I think they thought they were losing their identity and their specialism by being part of the tribe and be part of the um, you know multidisciplinary team. The, why they didn't want to be part of the gang of the trend? A uh, couple of things. Like once for years they'd argued. Yeah. So we have an expression in English: uh, poachers and gamekeepers. Does everyone know this? Poachers try to steal the. Uh, steal things and gamekeepers try and stop the poachers. So they'd always they'd always been in conflict for years and years, um, and uh, breaking the governance down and moving them together to work together was was causing uh, obviously caused them um, huge personal empathy problems. Become part of part of a tribe, part of a team, or part of uh, something else is like me having uh, multiple families. <laughs> so I'm dead from this family and dead from that family. So is I'm not having a true me. So I have to split, and this is quite schizophrenic. So meaning the purpose is not organization. So the purpose is what you're doing, right? Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Why not? So I'm not a huge fan of our tribes. So tribes and squads are just options. If you won't do it, it's not necessary. Oh. Exactly, but I, I was just uh, I feed, I'd, I'd like to use I like to use real world scenarios to talk about because they're more interesting. <laughs> because uh, I'm following uh, what Sabine said is, uh, what's the matter? What's the purpose? If you want to be part of system or not, who cares? I don't care. It's um, um, the thing that is agile is you build a system, you see emergent behavior, meaning your system is adapting himself until he finds his own way of, of, of working. And, and if you have here, you want to design multiple systems, you want to make something very complicated because it's a new way to not touching your functional silos, right, in a bank, which is traditional. Uh, hijack the word, uh, just to yeah. yeah. Is so what, one piece of information I've just added, this, I think part of the problem was this was the first area of the bank to go agile. Yeah. Um, and... Um, it was the credit risk people, but for all intents and purposes, we can just call them security. Yeah. Security people's primary loyalty is to security. Yeah. Um, not, sorry. Not delivering people. And why this part of the bank was being the first to, go to, to become HL? Is there any specific? Uh, random, completely random. So do you have any kind of, of uh, platform or ritual where these kind of concerns um, can be articulated by the people? We did. So that we had the retrospectives that collected up to uh, a group where all of the the kind of, um, I don't want to use the word leader, but it was more like um, where the product owners could go uh, and also any of the other managers, relevant managers, and this was called the marketplace. So at the marketplace, all the squads could get together. They could, they could discuss their, perhaps, you know, they might have a resource need. They could discuss and escalate an issue. Um, they could discuss anything that was like, you know, blockers or system blockers at that meeting. That got so bad, the uh, the people from the Center of Excellence walked out three times. So usually is the, one of the big issues is that we have now uh, Agile Competence Center, which is the former Lean Center, and mm -hmm. the former, uh, is it Community of Practice or the Center of Excellence or the Office of Methods and Tools? which are all obsolete. And the thing yeah. is organic, so meaning, but now is, maybe I give you a trick. What I tested, we call them all the experts. All experts are floaters. And they're floating around the, the team. Meaning their mission is not to control the teams, their mission is to protect the team from, inside, from outside in. And the mission is to coach the team so even in security, in, in, I was in, in, in high transactional uh, banking system. So we have the, the security guys. They came one day a week just to meet, like a coach, the team, and they had a pair, a relay in the team, because their mission is to hand over the knowledge. Yes. And, and that might be another issue. They were very protective of their knowledge. Yes. That's how you keep a yeah. place. Yeah, maybe the, the fear of 
being obsolete, you know. But I, I'm going to get to this uh, PR. Uh, I think these uh, experts or the floaters, they have to coach and they have to maybe also, also teach or help the, that uh, these competences or knowledge is, uh, is, is available also uh, inside of the, 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 the squads or, or I don't know of the teams right yeah. so um, maybe they didn't want to do the, that uh, already seeing that they would be like some obsolete uh, at, at one time maybe this was this, yeah. this type of problem you have the issue because we are also as a coach you are also expert and here's a, one other trick is if you're not in this system as a coach in agile you become some kind of controller and maybe then you have the effect of the of, you have the observer syndrome people are behaving when you're here which is different than they're really behaving uh yeah you know? i get that i get that all the time I, I used i used to hide behind the boards so i could watch the uh, the interaction so people didn't know i was there <laughs> yeah, one, of, one of the tricks when i help coaches is be a scrum master yes you have to be so then you have the recognition as part of the system and not outside the system that you're no longer a controller yeah yes i like that then here I should uh, marco should say no that's not possible <laughs> <laughs> so when i may to interrupt you i wish you a pleasant evening i have to leave at seven local time so see you next time guys and have fun ciao it was Thank lovely you. bye bye I've got one more story that I want to tell. Last story, okay? Um, and this is about football. Yeah. So we all know about Manchester United. There's a team. Of, there's two teams in Manchester, and one of them wears red. And it's called Manchester United. <laughs> uh, Manchester University did this um, test, um, and uh, what they did was they got football supporters in from Manchester United to write an essay on. Uh, why they loved Manchester United so much. And they came in and they wrote a big essay. And then, uh, and then when they, as they were going out, they said, look, thanks for coming in and writing the essay. Here's some money, or here's a token. If you go across to the canteen, you get a free cup of tea or a meal or something. And thanks for, thanks for doing this. And at that point, the exercise started because the whole writing the essay thing wasn't important. And as they were walking across to the, the canteen, what they did was they got people to run past and then pretend to fall and pretend to hurt themselves. You know, sachets of blood, everything else. Um, and uh, sometimes the runners would be, they did, they did this multiple times, sometimes the runners would be Manchester, Manchester United fans. You know, wearing a top, Manchester United. And sometimes they would be wearing a Liverpool top. And sometimes they would just have a, 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 an ordinary sports top. Every time the player was playing with a Manchester United top, or the, the runner was running with a Manchester United top, the person in the test would stop and pick them up. Every time they had a Liverpool top on, okay, they, uh, they stepped over them, did anything they could to try and avoid eye contact or anything. And it was 50-50 um, on the shirt, okay? They ran the test again, um, with other support, uh, with other supporters, and instead of asking them to write why Manchester United was so good, they asked them to write about why football supporters were so good. And what happened? They picked up the Manchester United supporters. This time, they now picked up the Liverpool supporters, and the people that didn't have a supporting shirt on, nobody ever got picked up. All of that behaviour, driven subconsciously, from the previous activity, and the previous activity was just, in one case, writing an essay. Where the uh, the kind of the idea of the in group was the um, Manchester United, and the other one is football supporters. Oh, so we what do we think? Of, what do we think about that? Is one is about asking the question in well, the question. The question is obviously um, who, in writing the essay, empathy was formed with a group, and depending on what the topic of the essay was. The impact of the empathy completely changed. Isn't it like priming for empathy? Sorry, Christoph. Isn't it like a priming for empathy? So you prime the people to have an empathy on something. Exactly. Are we talking about emotional resilience? I think we're talking about identification. 
and this is why, I, to go back to the example with the tribe and the squads, I think a lot of the identity was seen at the tribe level, the squad level, and none at the tribe level, if you, if you think back to that story. The people didn't actually identify with the tribe, they identified more with the team they were in. Um, I think this I think this idea of empathy is a lot stronger than uh, you know that we that we're given thought for. I've been kind of thinking about this in terms of um, who the biggest manipulators of empathy in the world are. It, so in the, in in the society and everything we live, who are the biggest manipulators of empathy? Who are the people that build the most empathy? My grandma. No, these guys. Oh, you have the prison of Bolivia. Why? No, no, no British. Well, <laughs> what happened? It, it's a little bit dated. <laughs> Uh, it's the idea that my group's better than your group, yeah. So the British are picked on within Europe. Um, you know, legal Americans are great. Illegal Americans are not. The sense of the sense of them and us, yeah. All these people are manipulating empathy. All this time as coaches, we build team empathy and we build strong team empathy. And what we're kind of doing is is almost like building up barriers to the other teams. I think. And is it not what we are doing with Agile, every old stuff? We believe we are right and the other are wrong? This is the Agile community, I think. Yeah, Kanban is the way. No, Scrum's the way. Safe's the way. Safe's not the way. Those, no. waterfall, those waterfall people are the problem. Safe, nothing to do with Agile. But this is what I was telling from the beginning. It's about group dynamics and... Yeah. Uh, I think one one of the, the basic findings of psychology is that we are still that the basic like paradigm for most people and groups is ethnocentric. So you identify with your peers, with your posse, and uh, you you dislike or suspect the people from the other posse, which is part of your identification. Yeah. And it's like uh, you can leave that. This is called like uh, development, like brain development, psychological development, but it takes time. And uh, I think we're going into this trap over and over again. And of course, politicians, leaders of all kinds uh, are, are using it. And they are some kind of uh, victims of this kind of uh, behavioral patterns, let's call it this. Yeah, but Agile itself and the whole Agile community is just so um, obsessed with um, small team empathy and not larger empathy for everyone and those especially those not in the even agile community i think as well we also need to look at um remember the football player story yeah where we if we if we say you're now the agile pilot and we're going to hold you up to be the agile people that take agile forward in the agile organization we've really we're almost automatically turned the rest of the organization into the enemy point is, is, is a little bit subtle. It's saying we, we make the boundary that we are going to be working in a new way. Yeah. And that immediately sets two groups up, an in-group and an out-group, and it immediately sets conflict. We must be intelligent enough to do this in a way that doesn't build conflict. And disagree. Conflict is the part of the grieving process. It's not easy. You, you do change in France and Germany, you have strong characters. It's not easy. If people say, oh, I want to have to change, be no trouble at all. It's sorry. Change is trouble. Mm -hmm. It's you to accept that it's not easy, that's okay. Now you have different speeds. You have to bring this kind of empathy, say, we are going in this new model, the other will become maybe obsolete and maybe not tomorrow, maybe in one year or five years or whatever. You take time to understand or not, meaning, you can have non-Agile people in Agile systems. It's the system which is Agile, it's not the people. We don't care. You can be free. But I would call this like the, the difference between dogmatism and re real diversity, because diversity always means conflict. I completely agree with Pierre. Mm -hmm. But it also means being able to have dialogue, and dialogue means to understand, to, to to connect to people in their difference and still kind of, of, of course, see where it's different, see where it's where we have a same, a same ground or same goal or same purpose, but still have differences. And mm -hmm. I try to make the differences like uh, um, 
to, uh, to, to, to make it constructive. To, to, right. Don't be destructive because every conflict can be constructive, it can mm -hmm. lead to some kind of good development, even if, you, if it's conflicting. But it, it can, of course, it can uh, deteriorate and, uh, uh, and uh, um, create polarities. And I think this is exactly what you have all over the world, not just in agile and non-agile. You mm -hmm. can look at it, the whole world, like look yeah. at Britain, right? Yeah, look great at America. Look at, look obviously at not in a very constructive uh, <laughs> dialogue together. <laughs> but I think this is one of the, the, like, the core competence. Like, look is at, the agile community able to to be still in dialogue with the non-agile, whatever this means. That's it. it I is like it. it. Is it, is it, sense, is it uh, anyway, is it uh, a, a clever to, to build up these uh, polarities? Maybe it's not. Yeah, uh, Peter Kruse explained that what we're talking about, talk about complex system, the complexity. Meaning we are on a network, we have the networking effect through internet, whatever. So the learning is different. And people are, we want to have people engage at work. And engage at work is bringing all your, your knowledge or maybe also what you don't know. You have to be free to experiment. I think the only thing I would add to conclude is I think we need, and I put the points to the side, I think we need to stop identifying so strongly with a group. So I, I do Agile, but I don't identify with any particular Agile. I've, uh, I can do Scrum, I can do Kanban, I can do Safe, I can do anything. I just don't identify with any of them. I think we need to elevate up to a higher level. Yeah, that what we're doing is changing organizations and not putting methods in. I think the methods are divisive. It's called compassion and not empathy, right? So compassion is, you know, the people in the team say no to you six times. Do you get pissed? No. You just say, these are lovely people. It's the compassion we need. We can't just say, Pierre, he agrees with me. I like him. You know, everyone else is wrong. I'm leaving it with the Dalai Lama. I, I would like to add something about what, say, what you say, Scott, uh, about compassion. Uh, I, I, I've been thinking, I, I would like to ask you, ask you a question. When, when we think in uh, like uh, emotional intelligence, we think we control emotional intelligence. We, we, think, we, we think we control or we can control our feelings. Uh, because because this, this thing is, is, is a matter of state of mind. You, you, you can, you can uh, help the, an organization to, to set things, to control some behavior. Uh, like open space will help you to 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 behave in some way, but there there will be other other part of of, of the people that that have something in their mind and that that, that the state of as as they should be. Uh, so I don't know if I, you understand my point. I do. But, uh, so I I I used to manipulate people. So if I said this, they would do that, and if I thought they would do this, if I did that then I could say things to make sure that they did what I wanted them to do. Now I'm less concerned about that. Even if it's acting out or bad behavior, I'd rather see the behavior and have people feel that that's okay to do. Almost like work on moving to a better place. I'd rather see the people I work with as, as humans, even if they're in competing teams, um, and, uh, and try and de-emphasize the competing bit, you know, and look at the common goals and things we're trying to do. So, so let's look at a company, right? Um, and let's talk about that security department. That security department, you know, could, you know, it could, it could be run with a guy with a bad temper and he tries to latch everything down in the whole organization and nothing's getting produced and the new customers aren't getting attracted and the, they're not making money. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you've read the Phoenix Project, there's a kind of scenario in there like that. Really what needs to happen is, is the organization itself needs to, needs to kind of almost um, understand the difficulties have the openness of conversation to get that guy who's got the problems to get some help on his problems because it's the optimization of the overall system that's much more important, you know, than the manipulation of any individual. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. But yes, uh, you're, you're trying to change, you're, you're, you're trying to change a, a, a company and there are some bad apples that, that, that they don't, that they don't, not, that they are not aligned, aligned to this uh, new values of the company that, to, that will help uh, this company to succeed. Yeah, you, you can manipulate those people. You can uh, set them uh, things to behave uh, better, but uh, you 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 reach only a certain change in one part of of this behavior, not the not the complete. I don't know. If no, I've got I've got an answer to that, but I'd like to see what everyone else's answer is, and then I'll come in with that answer. I think you've explained it really well. It's a 
it's it's a real life perception problem. I think Pierre and I are bad apples for starters. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I also think it's the idea of the compassion towards the puppy. If if someone's a bad apple, I usually like to find out why they're the bad apple, or why. And sometimes it's it's concern. Um, sometimes it's they see something that other people don't see. Sometimes it's they've been you know they they feel their opinions have been ignored. Fear. Yeah, fear. Another good one. Um, I I don't think there's bad apples. I don't think anyone started their career thinking let's go out there and you know disrupt the operation of the system. Again, uh, bring out uh, this the idea that maybe the one of the most important things in let's say continuously transforming systems. And I think this is what we are talking about if you talk about complex systems. It's a question that uh, it's continuously changing, transforming that the reflection level, and, and, and I think this is what Peter Kruse was stressing when he was talking about complex systems that still need, let's say, a, a, a dialogue or debate about values. So the common values is what kind of brings the system again together because a system which is just complex can be also what he called psychotic. He came from, from neuroscience and <laughs> a complex system, a psychotic system is very complex, but it's too complex because you have like, like ongoing association all the time, very complex, but not very functional, right? The complexity and I think the, 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 the functionality which is not breaking down the system again to, let's say, a stupid way of, of non-complexity, but keeps complexity uh, is like you need reflection, you need dialogue, you need places where people really can go and talk about all these ambiguities, about all these, let's say, who is the big apple, who is, is looking at who, with what criteria, with what idea in mind about who is not doing right, <laughs> who is doing wrong, who should do different, am I doing right or wrong? So all the stuff about the, the constructing reality process and everybody kind of linking together. So this is really a need of, uh, um, of I think, new forms of, of dialogue in the organization. I, I, I'm going to link, can I link your point there to Ulysses' point? If you've got a psychotic yeah. system, People are going to act badly and you'll get bad apples, right? Yeah. Removing the bad apples and keeping the system uh, will mean you'll just get another crop of apples that go bad. Uh, <laughs> you actually bad, bad, bad apples, yes, uh, bad apples is only a level. Uh, I, I will I, I would like to compliment <coughs> what you say uh, before uh, about values. What if a company used to, uh, t 20 years ago, was really nice with those, some values and now need to update those values? And what other problem with the values is that are so abstract. Well, please tell me what, what uh, in, in, in concrete, uh, what these values means to this company. Uh, but, but by examples, just, just let me know how this value will, will translate into a certain behavior and the specific practices that are uh, aligned to this value. And this value should be aligned to with this company that need to, to in what company need to transform this company. What are the values that need to uh, uh, update this company to, to succeed, to become more responsive, to blah, 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 blah. So uh, I, I think there are, uh, I, I don't know, th th this thing of values is something uh, confusing. And we talk about a lot of mindset, we talk about values, but we don't even know how to explain what are values or what is mindset. Because the question is, uh, are values really necessary? Ulysses, this is very prudent of you to propose that we should uh, make uh, examples of what this value means in, in the praxis, right? So we tried out to make some dynamics about this uh, in the teams. So maybe we got the company values and asked the people to find an example in the, in the day by day what does it means for them. And some, some of the values, uh, we found out that this this was very um, not not very much understood about the people. So maybe these values we should we should be able to change, right? Can I challenge, uh, can I challenge you here? Um, if you think about uh, Confucius, Confucius was writing about how to organize a, a big country, the huge China Empire. 
and it, it was never speaking about values. I guess I have the feeling that values is a never ending story and the values are completely, but what, what is important is that what Marcus mentioned is ceremonies. So uh, Confucius say to bind the culture together is to have ceremonies. Maybe one, two ceremonies. If I see my family, we're all spread out the world and we are a mix of cultures and we get divorced, we have newcomers and family. So the culture, the values have changed and the cultures of, when I, when I was young, it was not possible to marry somebody which is not the same religion that we have, and we did it. And we, not a foreigner, we did it. And we, you can't get divorced, and we did it. And so the values of my parents changed a lot, and the values of evolving. But my mom says, you can do whatever you want, but I want to see you for Christmas and for Easter. <laughs> And everyone, even the, the, the grandchildren, my children, my nephews, my nieces, they're coming from everywhere they are. They're always at Christmas and an Eastern there. They say, I don't care what you do. We have words at the whole year. So I think, and I think back about this, my mom is an accountant, right? Not very open mind, but she discovered with 80 that the value of the, because this was the real culture of our family is, I accept your difference because you are all strong characters, but at least you're here for Christmas and you're here for Easter. Mm -hmm. That's the big trick, which is about the scrum ceremonies, or maybe some ceremonies, when you can make the feedback moment, when you discuss, and then you say you don't care about the values. I, I would like to, I would like to, to, to add something sorry. Uh, with, with the scrum values. Be, be, no, this is, I need to... Yes, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes. Let Anne Catherine talk. Thank you. Thank you. I, I will leave soon. So I, I just wanted to share something with you about compassion. What I think about compassion, about love, is a powerful, inclusive force and dynamic. And if I cannot be compassionate with you or with someone, if I'm not compassionate with myself, which yes. means that I, uh, I, I went inside myself and went to see all my shadows and the thing I don't like in myself. And so I didn't put enough awareness about myself, my, my behavior, my thoughts, my, my beliefs, etc. And then when I did this work, I can go outside. So how could we transpose this movement to go inside first and then go outside to the other, to the relation, to a company, to a system. Go inside and then go outside. Beautiful. It's a good point. Well done, and Catherine. I agree. Sorry, Ulysses, the ladies first. No, th th thanks. Th thanks for... Uh, mm. For giving to and the word, I, I agree with you, and uh, th that's what I wanted to say when 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 we we are uh, trying to 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 use uh, some practices and methods, but uh, but in the end, it, it, deep inside of us, we are not okay. So it's, it, it's it doesn't matter the practice. You 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 won't behave as you should be. And and t talking about the values, I think in most of the trainings, we we talk about ceremonies. We talk about uh, uh, um, the practices, but we don't talk about what is the meaning of that value to the team. For example, openness, it's something really wide. So every time I train some a team, I say, what is openness for you? This tell me a uh, practice that you will use in, in, in to, to, to own openness or, or tell me, uh, other, other examples of focus or tell me another example of respect for you. What is respect for me? It's different from respect for Pierre and it's different from respect for Anne. So I, I agree with Pierre that values really why, why, why never end concept. So let's, uh, let's, let's put a meaning on the team of these five values that we have in Scrum to, to exemplify what are, what, how this behavior and how this practice will really be related to these values. And, and, and this can help the team to understand what are the values, not only, oh, let's do the values. These are the five values of Scrum. And, and the people don't have an idea and don't have a clue what these values are. So uh, if I'm coming back to Scott's question about ethics, so the, the real effect in Agile or something like this is be yourself. And be your true yourself. 
and be your best self? Not even. I can be my worst. Uh, <laughs> that's me, right? It's black and white. It's not never proper. This makes you a human. The, what, is, what creates traction is not perfection. It's imperfection. And Catherine, about seductions, what are you thinking about this before Scott is starting? <laughs> no, I'm, 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 I'm in a happy, I'm in a, I'm in a very happy place. I, I love the, what uh, Anna Katrina said. I have a good friend always say you fall in love about on a person for his good side, and you love them for his wrong, bad side. I don't want people falling in love with me. I want people loving me. Because I love them. I, I love think I, they love you. They love you if they also are able to love your bad sides. Absolutely. That's true love. Yeah. I I do I do think a lot of our bad sides are responses to um, situations. Yeah. So it's it's kind of unhappiness frustration worry and things and um and to be to be better in ourselves you know tackling some of that work and doing that work is, is really important i wonder i know a lot of psychologists have had a lot of problems and that's why they become psychologists do you think a lot of agile coaches have had problems so they become agile coaches they're not trying to fix the world Yes, so what? <laughs> and, 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 the, and the thing is also, uh, uh, it's, one thing is complicated is to accept our bad sides. Accepting that we are not perfect. Yeah. Yeah, maybe then if we could do this internally, yeah, accept this or find it out, that we are bad also and so, then we could maybe have more compassion, more understanding, um, yeah, have respect. Yeah. Like Anne Catherine said, things begin uh, inside of the people and then they can resonate to the, to the others. So for example, this respect value of Scrum, uh, originally, yeah, this begins with you. If you can respect yourself, so you can respect the others. So maybe uh, one of the problems also is uh, that today, uh, and also Elise has told it, that we don't have this, this understanding about these values and so about ourselves. We just go and put the card and um, our body is there, but maybe not, uh, not ourselves <laughs> completely. So we go in and fight about the methods and fight about mm -hmm. about these things so here, here, so here's the thing about respect and here's the thing i think i was saying around about we focus at a lower level so every scrum team i've ever set up has had respect at its core yeah and probably within four weeks it's hating everyone that isn't doing scrum <laughs> so the respect only extends to the team it's not, it doesn't extend to the organization <laughs> Yeah, that's a level of learning. <laughs> and, you, know, you, you learn from failures. And that's a failure. Yes. That's cool. and so uh, I had teams, my, I had teams, seven teams uh, behaving like uh, very weirdly with the head of infrastructure because they're fighting. And the guy has a meeting just after the meeting with me. He was crying in front of me. So the guy was 60 years old, so he crying in front of me. So, uh, okay, I have very good commitment. Then I moved back to team eight teams. You behave like assholes, <laughs> and it was that point. So acknowledge a reverse acknowledgement, and then say, "Okay, you got it. How can we do this better? We, we did wrong, and it's okay. We we make shit. That's okay. And okay, how we can do better the next time? And so they say, "Oh yes, because they are all very passionate. You know, and this is what we are expecting, right? Passionate people." And then sometimes when it doesn't work, yeah, highly emotional. Sorry, Mark. What if they believe that what they did is correct or if it's right? 
Okay, then you ask the question, should we work again with this kind of infrastructure? Or do you have a better idea? What's best for the system? This is the bit about, I think if we can pull our, our empathy up to a higher level, we'll have less contention between different groups of people. When we hold it just at team level, uh, our, our, yeah, and focus on just the team, uh, we don't think so much about the rest of the organization and we, you know, we might have less respect, uh, you know, and they, and the thing is that people that don't respect me, I don't tend to respect. So that it becomes a cycle. Isn't this the, 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 maybe the, the most important learning aspect, let's say in the back of all that agile working together is to really learn to that empathy and compassion means to have a strong opinion, of course, and uh, a strong opinion about what is best for me, what is best for my team, and also what is my opinion, what's best for the company. But at the same time, really see that this is just your opinion, man. It's nothing else. And maybe your neighbor has a completely... The dude, the dude abides. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, the dudes, uh, like a Zen attitude. You can have a strong attitude, but it's just your opinion, man. Really you have to be able to, to connect to the, your neighbor's strong opinion and that neighbor also. And I think this is really what it's all about. And so sometimes it's good to, 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 to become a little bit uh, egocentric because it's tr strengthening your opinion in the system. Yes. And at the same time, you have to be able to, to pull back your egocentricity in order to listen to other people and really to change your mindset. Because I think mindset is, is shouldn't be like, like a rigid mindset, but true. I totally agree with that. Uh, the, so, so, sometimes I, I'm trying to practice active listening and, and, and it's not something that you can control. It's, it's something that you are trying to empathize with other and it's difficult to explain how, how you can be an active listener uh, it's, it's it's a state of mind that that is my resume and I, I i i would like to add this this thing of dalai lama i i i, I am really amazed how we are reaching this uh, part of the things in in work that we we are little by little coming to more like values spiral trilogy uh to to more deep things inside of us. Uh, I, I think we, we, we are not perfect, but it's our duty to work on how to be better. Uh, how, how, because, because if you don't, if you don't, if you behave a, in a bad way, life itself will hit you, will hit you that uh, you are bad. And, 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 and if you are behaving uh, uh, com with compassion, with, with openness, with active listening, uh, this will, uh, life, itself will give you back some good things and it, it, it the same happened to the team when, when the team in, in just uh, more than an average level this this could be a growing team but once this team is is below one one no return point this 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 group this team it's, it's not able to to keep continue working together because because they hurt each other and they are not uh, able to keep continuing so this is the same for for a social team. Uh, social team for is is also the same for 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 ourselves, and it's also the same for ourselves with with a relation with a company. If a company hurt us in uh, uh, a point of no return, we we don't get back to that company, and it's the same uh, in 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 the opposite way. So I I am really uh, enthusiastic because I, I've been experimenting. Uh, things like this uh, thing and reading a lot, a lot about, about meditation and how to become better, how to understand your weak points. And, and this is uh, something, uh, uh, well, for me, really interesting uh, to apply in organization and companies and in teams. Yeah, I think we're talking about negotiation. Another team has to negotiate in a win-win situation. So you can be an eccentric or egocentric and somebody who is more introvert, but you have to be, have a win-win. You have to keep the balance. The problem is when the balance is no longer right, which happens sometimes. And so when you have this uh, system thinking mentality, the balance right, so 
on his way, there's some kind of response. So they say, okay, I have my place here. Is when you avoid negotiation. And the traditional management in banks, like securities, they don't like to negotiate. But they've got, they've got lots and lots of fear. Yeah, and, and, and dictatorship is always local. And the people running that always manipulate the empathy. So we're security, we're the last line of defense here, everyone out there is a hooligan, we're the only people that can keep the bank running, you know. These are the, these are the stories and narratives that we tell. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure, that's, that's terrible. But now back to uh, one of the points of uh, what says about the uh, uh, crazy, complex behavior, schizophrenic behavior is, I think maybe there's an answer from Dave Snowden because this behavior in the complex is called chaos, which mm -hmm. is really different than complex in the Kenneffian way of doing things. Because the, you're, you're, you're sharing a common purpose, which is the, 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 the way it binds you together. And that purpose can be whatever you want. And, and that's, that's a good trick. So, and, and to make this happen, the big trick is when he has shared his story about the eight years old children uh, birthday party. So if you let the children at the birthday party, you give you a house, they destroy the house, they had a lovely party, and you're just pissed, right? But if you say kids, you can make a party in room one, number one, number two. If somebody else gets out a kill them, they will also have a great party. So meaning is the other system, of evolving system. So meaning is the boundaries like kids when are very, when you have infants, the boundaries are very safe, giving the freedom of safe. But now, when, they, when they're getting bigger, they have to enlarge the system. And when they're adults, they're adults. They let them go, right? And so having these boundaries, if you don't have the boundaries, boundaries are part of this, con the container helps the, the way of doing uh, the, the complexity. We, you can call it a team, you can call it a, a sprint or an iteration, which is some kind of containers. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Which brings, us to the, <laughs> which brings us to the interesting questions when we live in a world of adults. So we have no leaders uh, behaving like uh, moms and dads or kings and queens and stuff. How do a lot of adults to come, come to, 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 let's say, common purposes? Because purposes is not given. It's not a given. And I think this is what, uh, for me, is like, um, it's like, um, because we often think that for, for that, like a company, the purpose is clear. And I think, yes, it can be clear, but everybody has a, like an own interpretation of the purpose. And, of, and the question is really, how do you keep it flexible to meet? So to negotiate, what is the purpose right now for let's say this customer, this customer, this customer, but as the world is changing quickly, mm -hmm. you have like the, the, the negotiation process has to be also like fluid and flexible that's, and that's, not determined by leaders or by, let's say, dogmas and stuff. And I think this fluidity... That's the alignment part of fucking behavior. If you know a little bit about it, mm. this fucking is you have the alignment part is mm. why we are here, in the common purpose, then you have these dynamics. And sometimes to time you have to ask, are oh, the, the purpose always the same? <laughs> or did it change? And what is your purpose, you as individual? And maybe the purpose has changed. And you should allow him to cha it to change, right? Yeah. You have to uh, co-create it and let feedback open. Yeah? It can change. It will change. So your system has to have this mechanism that it's, it will be co-created all the time. When it's needed, it's refined. If not, maybe this is the big clash is going on. So <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> so an example is Play 14. Play 14 is for me uh, designed to be a model of agile organization. And now we're experimenting when we have, uh, we have 18 play 14. <laughs> then we have, I have my colleague, one of our co-founder in Luxembourg, say, who wants to manage it. They say, 
oh, I have no time because it's a nonprofit, this takes too much time. I say, let them do, let them free, let them do whatever. So now I have the first white t-shirt of Play 14 because Vienna hijacked it. First white. Yep. And the hijack is, I think, <laughs> okay. And then, then you have to let it go, meaning because the system is getting bigger, more complex, say what is the more important? Is it me and the three co-founders? No, that's the way to do. Then it's very egocentric. Or you're looking at a city, oh, you're doing this this way, good. And then you discover that the model was designed based on open space technology with a little bit slightly with this first half day is socializing. Then you have two days of uh, open space. You have to, open space is the safe to fill container. And you behave like you want into it. And because you create a dynamic, so you have impact, mm. and dynamic energy into it, then you have not a flat open space. You have a passionate open space. And people are getting crazy, coming with completely crazy ideas because they're feeling safe. They are not afraid. They say, oh, these guys are all crazy. I can't try my thing. Cool. So you have multiple layers. So the framework, the frame, the organizational of Play 14 are always the same all around the world. So if you go into Play 14 at Ulysses Place in Mexico, you feel, yes, yes, it's a Play 14. Or like Mark is going in Basel, they say, yes, that's it. That has different taste. We know the music, but the interpretation is different. And if I want that you're following the music and you play the interpretation, then you break, you're breaking down the system. Yeah, agile is jazz. What? Agile is jazz. Yes. Uh, how, how do you use this format here of open space? I, 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 uh, to, to they redesign the operations, to redesign the rest of the tasks of the of the organization. Because uh, going in an open space and, and 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 just choose what you want to learn or what you want to share, it's it's really amazing. It, it, this is really a, a nice format. A small format can al that allows you to 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 get the more deep into the relation. That is really nice. But but how to do that in a bigger organization with other kind of tasks? This is like, uh, interesting, perhaps, to, to discuss how to... What, are, what are yeah. I do with SAP, <laughs> for example, which is absolutely not easy, guys. But you, keep, you have this in mind. But the thing is, you have to come with the end in mind. And you don't know how long it takes. The problem is, if you're going agile, you're not ex explain that's agile. If you reach agile, you have place for interpretation, and you have such kind of fight like Scott uh, mentioned, is, oh, this is agile, this is not agile. Sorry, that's boring like hell, right? But if you say, if you have, we have here a model, it's called, uh, I would call it AO, uh, sorry for advertisement about my, my thing, is it, this is the ultimate agile, is if you like play 14, that's the ultimate agile. And how close do you want to go? In, our, in coaching, we call it design alliances. So, okay, how far do you want, or maybe not yet? And then we call it an agile venture, right? Is each team is like acting like a small startup and you have a portfolio and the, and the governance is acting like a venture or like a private equity. Making funding, I can buy the company. So you, you reverse the merger and acquisition process internally, not externally. But what happens before? Then you have to think about system thinking. Here's the big place when Marcus has to come. I say, yeah, good. Because you have to learn first, you have to break down the silos because the silos are based on structure. Structure is we build this one forever, should be like ever this. But the problem, this doesn't work because the whole world is changing. It's that's a fight. And now people have been trained to keep the silos in place and they say, sorry, these silos are not working. And we have to think about system. And system or creating value, so like project and, pro and, and programs. But then you discover, okay, where is my, my transactions, transactional work, which is just the routine, and maybe you can automatize this now. And, and, and then you can go in the more in the system thinking approach. Then you open it for more agile, more diversity. 
that you have to have this learning path. From one jump now, from now here, now you're free to do something. Usually people are stuck to say, what? And this is what, as a coach, you have to help them to pass the bill. And, and some teams are faster and some other, and that's okay. I mean, that's okay. You don't need to be that far. And, and at the end, you have a role organization, a result or only workable uh, enterprises. Is you gather if you gather, you meet when you meet, but that's not easy. And, and, and so we, and there's a lot of things. You have to shift from cost center to profit center, team level. That's the win. So sorry, you're on finance costs the thing. Money is key. Uh, if you want to get the manager in, you see, that's the money. It's not uh, overperform for 40 times, you go in asset managers, you just don't care. My, it's risk management. You see, but if you consider every team, every individual as just a service center, so you have a never ending budget, you say, no, my budget, is, my team can create return of investment, and then we can measure it. This is helpful to shift in the system thinking approach then, then to open it to uh, Agile, because Agile is in the evolution of Lean. Yeah, I, I, I always say this thing that, um, so we've, we've got a term in English, PTSD, have you heard of it? Um, yeah. yeah, I think, I've never picked up a team in finance that didn't have PTSD, <laughs> I got it. And a lot of my work, and a lot of my work has just been uh, almost like counseling, even before we could start layering the process and top. The ceremonies help, yeah, uh, and other things help. Um, I was at, I got an interview yesterday at uh, at a big bank, and one of the questions was, um, "How would you how would you promote psychological safety?" And I said, "Well, I can do all the work, and I can do all the teaching, and I can do all the opening the space and everything else." But the first time that team asks you something, and you as a leadership team decide not to do it, then there's no psychological safety. Yeah. Yeah. And that team cannot say yes to anything unless you allow them to say no. And then I show. <laughs> but I just want to remind you that uh, they talked about all this complex system theory stuff. That if you look at anthropology and, and uh, ethnology, I think you re re we really have to keep in mind that hierarchy and all these variations of hierarchy like are the, let's say, the most, um, the, let's say, the, the, the strongest paradigm of, of how to organize a big group, which also emerged. It didn't, not, it's not God imposed this on earth, but yeah. it simply emerged as, as groups and people to, to, to become like in, into more and more and bigger and more, uh, uh, um, yeah, groups, right? And so hierarchy is still, it's, it's, it's a complete self-organizing system, but it has its limits. And maybe we, we, we experience more and more the limits of a, a hierarchical self-organized system. And so the pressure comes to, to be creative and find new ways of organizing. I, 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 I think part of the problem is a lot of that programming isn't cultural. I think a lot of that programming comes uh, hardwired into us. The DNA. And part of our biases. Uh, and when, when you, so Mark is writing here. Uh, your I like the quote. Yeah. But I would just uh, change the but, but by an end. Yeah. But I like the quote, so thanks. So Yerka is also a self organized system, but it has its own limits. And if you go back to the, uh, I worked, I was thinking about this. At the beginning, the king, the king was just the Lord Protector, is the guy who was here to protect the farmers against every threat outside. And then the problem is, uh, I want that my kids are doing the same job. And then they hijacked on a human purpose. Like, it is really human. You have to do the same thing uh, my son that I do. And maybe the third generation changing completely. Uh, is that you are you are my servant? But uh, I know that in the, in the British history at the Bronze Age, they haven't they haven't organized society without any authority, and it worked. In 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 yeah, and here in complex system is it was a 
Interestingly, it was a female-led society. Yeah, exactly. Very interesting. And I, I, I think that's the hope for the agile community. <laughs> yeah, but you have an example also. Like, uh, I tested, uh, I put the, uh, I tested Scrum until the end, and I was like, okay, what's the role of the product owner? Product owner and the Scrum master are just team members uh, doing one Scrum mastering is another product ownership. And these are not authorities at all because it will change completely the behavior of the team. Then you have a real team. And if, yeah, if, you, if you, you failed your scrum exam, but you've done well with the team. Yeah, <laughs> I, how many times have I been asked, should the product owner be at the retrospective? It's like, I'm like, don't ask me that. They're part of the team. They're part of the team, that's it. And we had team working at SAP, which, sorry, are not easy, guys. <laughs> and, you know, mostly very German, so even the women, hardcore, that no, very strong no, and people from everywhere, and it worked well. And having, removing this way of thinking, I'm an authority, go away. And maybe the last quote, because I'm talking too much again, is... I have to leave soon. Yeah, I, I have to go to the toilet. Next time, a short pause. Next time. I have 80 CFOs in, in, in the call and they ask me what is agile. They say, agile now, you're a CFO, you, have a, you keep your role, you keep your position. And if I ask you, you can stay in your job or choose another job, what do you want to do? I don't want to stay in my job. And so now, if I'm, if I'm now a member of the board, I'm a board director. They say, you keep your position, you keep your salary, whatever, and you keep your money, a budget, to do something that matters for the company. Are you doing this? It's oh, hell yes. So here, Peter's law is pe people are usually having a bad behavior because they're not feeling well in the position. Yeah, I agree. I think we're... Thanks a lot, Scott. Thanks a lot, Pierre, for this great discussion. No, thanks so, very much. So, I'm good. And I really enjoyed it. Thank you. The so next time, Mark and Christoph, they have to fight against our big bosses because we are all very passionate. <laughs> <laughs> will do, will do. <laughs> uh, thank you for making this great. The next one will be, I guess, in the two weeks and will be an open space. Mm -hmm. I think we have to make more open spaces. Yeah. Right? Thank cool. you. Thank you. Uh, Pierre? Thanks. Can I ask you a question thank for you. Yeah, I stopped the recording so we can talk.